from this moment forward. You walk in integrity. You walk in righteousness. And our gracious God, the God who loves us, heals and protects and, and builds into our lives and can make all things new. He has that marvelous capacity. Some take those words and say, well, that's a license for sin. If God is going to be so good about forgiving me, if God is so good at restoring my soul, like the psalmist said, then I'll just do whatever I darn well please, mess up my life, and then I'll run to God and say, restore me. What does Paul have to say about that? Romans chapter 6. What does Paul have to say about those who would say, well, we should continue in sin because God's grace just gets poured on us in abundance. What did he say? Should we continue in sin? May it never be. Absolutely, unequivocally, no. That is no way for the child of God to respond to the grace and love of God. It's probably an indi- Oh, this is harsh. It's probably an indication that you know nothing about being one of God's children. Is that sobering? Not my call. Not my job to go around and say, you don't look like a child of God. But if your attitude is so cavalier and so callous toward the death of Christ that you would be willing to voluntarily heap that sin on his precious body, then you probably know nothing of his saving grace in your life. And so a a real challenge, a real challenge. Should we continue in sin so that God can, can be more and more gracious to us? Absolutely not. It's unthinkable. God forbid. The only alternative is to repent. And she made it abundantly clear. You turn your back on it. You say, no. And you call out to God, Lord, I'm weak. This is impossible for me, but I'm calling on you to be my salvation. Save me from sin through the precious blood of Christ. Save me from error. Save me from those things that would do damage to me and my relationships and my my interaction with you, the living God. And what a gracious God we have. Incredible healing. Incredible joy. And that's the testimony of millions. Okay? One of the worst things we can do would be to wallow in guilt. To let guilt dominate our lives. What God wants is for us to be repentant, confess it, and seek his grace to move on with life. Not to be thinking about all the terrible things that have happened and the mistakes we've made and so on and so forth. Paul says, I I forget those things that are behind. He was probably talking in the context of those wonderful, powerful things that he did. But it's true from the negative things in his life too. I forget those things. I have to put them out. I can't forget it, Lev. I can't forget it. It haunts me. You can. It's called replacement thinking. Somebody says, don't think about pink elephants. And so everybody right now is forming a little vision. I can stop myself from that. I can replace the thought of pink elephants with orangutans. No, I don't want blue elephants. It's too close. Orangutans or or something else. We can refocus. Let's not be ridiculous here. When guilt comes and there's been a, a heart of repentance and confession has been made, When guilt comes, you know who it's coming from, don't you? And I don't know what your technique is for dealing with the enemy of your soul. But one of the things I have to do when that guilt sweeps over me is to say, Satan, and I say it out loud, Satan, you are a defeated foe. The blood of my Savior Jesus has paid for all my sin. So get away from me. Quit bugging me about this. That helps me. And then I have to go to the word of God and I have to memorize it, stick it in my brain. And listen, it's much easier for you as a 20-year-old than it is for me 
at my advanced age. Okay, the, gray, the, the, the brain cells are dying by the billions at my age. But you still have a capacity to memorize Scripture. You can still take it in. And you know what? You can do it not just to please Sanchez, but you can do it for the refreshment and building of your own soul. And when those attacks come, you can replace what is in your brain and it seems locked there. Remember I told you about those images? I can replace those images with the pure, beautiful, wonderful word of God. I'm the vine. You're the branches. And I, and I start to quote scripture and, and I allow God to use that to build into my life the character and the, and the, re, the, the reconstruction um, that I so desperately need. Be careful who you talk to about these things, okay? Be careful. Okay, sin strikes at the very root of your being. It's a unique sin. It impacts every fiber of your being. Is that the one? All right. Verse 15 of chapter 6. Don't you know? Have we heard that one before? Why does he say that? What's he trying to communicate? You should know this. We've already gone over this before. Verse 15. Don't you know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? The answer? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, will become one flesh. And then in verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple? So there's three areas. Don't you know that your body is a member of Christ? As part of the body of Christ, you have a very sacred, valuable place. And that physical body that God has given is to be protected. We need to be concerned with it. We need to be very, very responsible with how we conduct ourselves. Verses 16 and 17, he talks about people engaged in sex become one body with one another. We don't even have to describe the physical uh, imagery for you to understand what that's all about. When we talk about marriage, we talk about oneness, oneness. And that is physical oneness as in sexual relations. But it's also in the emotional aspect. It's in the social aspect. It's in the creative aspect in every facet of your life. And sex is the engagement of two people into one. God says, I own you. You belong to me. Don't be prostituting your body with someone else. Now, what's the exception to that? When is it appropriate? When it's your spouse in marriage. And God is so creative and wonderful that he can allow us the beauty of a marriage relationship. Sex was designed for it. And we can still, while we're being one with our spouse, we are still one with Christ with no problem. In fact, The closer my relationship with the living God, the closer my spouse's relationship with the living God, the closer we are to one another. And you've seen that triangle. God, me, my spouse. And as we move in proximity, as we move in closeness and oneness with God, we become closer to one another. It's a beautiful thing. God has done it. Don't you know, verse 20, that you in your body are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit? Did you catch what kind of spirit it is? It's his Holy Spirit, the very essence of God, the Spirit of God lives within us. And so we must be people who take God's standard and say, I will practice the morality regarding sex that God has established. How do we do that? There is a solution, and it's found in verse 18. Flee sexual immorality you heard pam stenzel say that that's not hard she says flee you can almost hear the apostle saying 
for all the stated reasons and for all the reasons that have ever been given to, sp- to be sexually pure, flee sexual immorality. What does that mean? It means to run away from it. Duh. It doesn't mean to mess around and play with it for as long as you can and as involved as you can without crossing certain lines. Think of the kid whose mom puts on his shoes after a rain and tells him as he's playing out in the yard, don't go near the puddles. Okay? The puddles are sexual immorality. I'm just, you know, they're not really. But just to draw the picture. Okay? If he's going to flee the water puddles, he's going to stay as far away from them as he possibly can. But if that's a water puddle, and he's like most young boys that I know, he's going to examine the edges. He's going to experiment with his foot. He's going to see how far he can step in without it going over the sole of his shoe. And on and on until pretty soon he's knee deep in the puddle. When I was in grade school, the the playground drained into this area down by the railroad tracks where the fence came through. And it made this beautiful swamp back there. And it was highly forbidden. We were not to go anywhere near it. Where did I spend most of my recesses? By the swamp. Okay? That's in the heart of man. God says, oh, love. I told you to flee from that stuff. Yeah, but it looks like it's so much fun. That's really cool. You go in there, you get it over your boots, and and your shoes get, I mean, your socks get all wet, and then you go get to sit in class and go (laughs) in the bottom of your shoes. Oh, that's really neat. That's really an enjoyable experience. Do that often, Lev. I did it every day. God says when it's sexual immorality, run. Don't prance along the edge like this to see if you can balance and keep from falling in. No, get over here. Now, I'm going to let your imaginations decide what that looks like for you, all right? When you're with another person, you need to be in a situation where you both are fleeing sexual immorality. You heard Pam saying over and over again about the demands that guys put on girls in relationship, the expectations that are there. We need to change all that. We're believers in the Lord Jesus. We are Christians. And what we, what we exhibit needs to be Christ-likeness. And I don't even want to think of, of tarnishing the person of Jesus. And I don't want others to see a tarnished Christ when they see me. Flee fornication. Run from it. Avoid it at all costs. Did you read Morris yet? He said this way. It means make it your habit to run. It's an habitual thing. And I can't fill my mind with sexual garbage from the movies. And I can't let my mind roll over and over again with sexual innuendo in in the jokes that I um, have heard or in the uh, music that I'm accustomed to. I can't do that and be avoiding the habit, avoiding even the possibility. So, men, we've got to make a decision. Are we going to be pure in the realm of sexual uh, morality? Are we going to be pure? And if so, we're going to have to draw a line about what we watch and what we listen to and what we talk about. And here's the biggie, because remember, it's the brain that's the prominent, uh, pr- uh, predominant sex organ. What I allow myself to think about. Girls, I don't know what your problems are. I'm addressing what I know goes on inside the mind of a man. You deal with whatever you need to deal with, but we need to replace 
even the thought of sexual imp impropriety with that which God has provided for us. I've said this several times. Your mind is your predominant sex organ. You need to protect your mind from evil. And so Morris and the Apostle Paul agree that even the thoughts related to evil we need to flee from. Run from. Now that's kind of a negative way of looking at it, isn't it? That's sort of the negative. Is there anything positive about this business? And the, and the answer is clearly there in verses uh, 18, 19, and 20. Let's look at that. What do we do? On the other side of things, while you're running away, you are glorifying God. Jesus said that is becoming to, God, to Christ's disciples. John 15, 8 suggests that it, bearing fruit brings glory to God. So there's a positive aspect. Wow, how could I bear fruit? Let's see. I could let the Holy Spirit work in me to produce love, joy. Keep going. And what is the end of that statement? Self-control. Thank you, thank you. And Paul says, against such things, we don't have any rules. Isn't that cool? Oh, you're loving too much. Only so much love can be shown in this. No, no rules about how much you love. Hey, quit having so much fun and joy in your life, Carlson. Come on. No more happiness. Get that smile off your face. No rules against that. God says, have all the joy you want, but also have all that self-control. And by doing so, you will bear much fruit. And in this shall my father be glorified. We glorify God with a, a right response. You're not your own. You've been bought at a price. How much did, pay, did he pay for you? What was the price? The precious blood of Christ, says Peter. Therefore, glorify God with your body. I think this is a, a true statement. You test it, will you? Purity in the sexual realm brings glory to God. Every hour, every minute that you are sexually pure, it brings glory to God. And you know, guys, we may have to do it a minute at a time. But every second that we're bringing glory, every second, second that we're being pure in this area... We bring glory to God. What is glory? Well, we understand it to be that, that bright light, that radiance. Remember when, when um, uh, Peter and James and John went up to the mountain of transfiguration and they saw Jesus? And, and it says that his, his robes became bright white, right whiter than any, any uh, laundry could ever wash it. And they witnessed the glory of Christ. There was that bright light. But there's more to it than that. It also can mean the concept of weight. Weight? Yeah, like weight as in clout or honor. To magnify, to increase his reputation, to strengthen his position. Now, how can I as a mortal strengthen the position of God? Well, I don't actually strengthen God's position. He's, he's all in all. He doesn't need me to strengthen him. But if I am living a life that's bringing glory to Jesus, I allow Dan to have a better view of God. Does that make sense? God is strengthened in Dan as he sees me living a life that's pure. My brothers in Christ are encouraged to be more godlike when they see it in me. And ladies, let me tell you, there is nothing that moves a man's heart like seeing a woman who glorifies God. I'm thankful that over the last 20 some years that I've been in Emmaus, I've met, I'm going to say thousands, I've met thousands of young men 
who love Jesus and who absolutely delight in finding a woman of God who is willing to radiate the person of Christ. I was telling my marriage and family class today, a lot of times what you hear from young kids when you're working with them in in the youth group is nobody wants the the virtuous woman. If, If we have honored the impure, the lustful women over the godly women that God has put in our lives, shame on us. Shame on us. Governance, you're getting kind of carried away today. A little wound up here. I'm sweating. I'm heated. But you know what? How can we miss it? It's so abundantly clear. Where are those godly men? Where are those righteous women? Let them stand up. And let's make those the ones that we honor because they are bringing glory to Jesus. There are consequences to failure. I cannot possibly hold sexual impurity to my chest and not be alienated from my God. I can't possibly entertain sexual impurity in any level and be, uh, uh, be free from guilt. And here's where it gets really tough. Because dreams are shattered. Dear friend of mine, deeply in love with a young lady, committed to marrying her. And she had to present to him some sexual impurity. And my heart was broken as he absolutely wept. He wept uncontrollably. His shoulders shook. Every every part of him was, was, was in deep grief because he had this dream. He had kept himself pure for his wife, and he expected that she would have kept herself pure for him. They married. They married. They struggled. Praise God, through his wonderful forgiveness, his ability to heal, he's, he's making a wonderful relationship out of them. But it was a terrible thing. Dreams are shattered. I've done marriage counseling <clears throat> where the wife turns to the husband of 20 years and says, if you hadn't pushed me sexually before we were married, I could have a lot more respect for you today. 20 years of resentment. Just like old Adam did, her fault. She should have said no. She should have stopped me. And we cast the blame. And then that root of bitterness. You heard of that one? Hebrews talks about a root of bitterness. What does the root of bitterness do according to Hebrews 13? Is it 13 or 10? Hebrews 10, I think it is. What does that root of bitterness do? Anybody know? It defiles, says the word of God. It defiles. And there grows in us this this callousness and this hardness of heart. And the bitterness and the callousness continue to grow. It's almost like a cancer. And pretty soon, we're almost immune from being touched by the living God. There's consequences of failure. And I don't want you to live there. We'll quit right now. Thank you. (laughs) 